So after my last two videos about ocean circulation and composition and how those things work and how they've been changing over Earth's history and how they're currently changing, I thought it'd be good for me to post a kind of short summary recap video about all the ways that the ocean is currently changing and how that's impacting marine and terrestrial life. So let's get started. So as we discussed in the last couple videos, the oceans have changed in many ways throughout Earth's history, including to list just a few in circulation. They've changed in circulation due to sometimes tectonics, tectonic plate movement, or global temperature changes, or both uh, in sea level due to temperature changes or and or tectonics, um, in salinity due to changes in glacial extent uh, and continental weathering rates, in pH, acidity, alkalinity due to, well, now at least carbon dioxide input and mixing to the ocean. Uh, and in oxygen concentrations throughout Earth's history, the oxygen concentrations in the ocean have changed drastically from being nearly negligible at the beginning of Earth's history before photosynthesizing organisms began producing oxygen in appreciable amounts. And uh, then it rose dramatically around 2.4 billion years ago. And then again, later around seven to 600 million years ago. And then it has fluctuated and gone up and down at much higher levels ever since then. And in primary productivity rates or photosynthetic rates at the ocean surface from algal blooms and such, these have changed throughout Earth's history due to changes in nutrient influx and the amount and rate at which nutrients are, are being input uh, to the ocean in different regions. And in this video, we're going to cover the ways that the oceans are currently changing. And some of these changes are like these mentioned here, which have happened over and over in Earth's history, which is nice because when we see those events in Earth's history, we can actually get a better idea of what we might expect for how those changes might play out on modern Earth and the impact they might have. The first two that come to mind when we think about what's happening to the oceans today is obviously one, warming due to the warming atmosphere, and two, increased CO2 due to the increased atmospheric CO2 and increased CO2 causes ocean acidification or the lowering of ocean pH, which I'll uh, explain why on the next slide. But essentially, these two effects, warming and acidification of the oceans, are not only occurring, but are occurring at a rapid rate, which is really harmful to marine life, since most species cannot adapt that quickly to keep up with the changing conditions. This is true not only of warming and acidification, but of any changing conditions that have ever happened on Earth's history. If they're rapid on geologic timescales, then life you know, doesn't adapt and evolve quickly enough to keep up with those changes. If they're gradual, they're much easier for life to handle, and therefore, when we see mass extinctions like the Big Five in Earth's history or the current six mass extinction, we see that the, the difference here and the reason there's a mass extinction is because of such rapid change, not necessarily the magnitude of change. Corals have been specifically hit very hard by the current warming and acidification trends, uh, and this is really uh, a delicate kind of ecosystem to hit because they are the dominant reef builders in the modern oceans. In Earth's past, reef builders have been anywhere from sponges to algae to bacteria to other types of phyla that aren't even around anymore. So uh, reef builders have been many things, but corals are the dominant reef builders in the modern oceans, which means that they really are these ecosystem building and maintaining species that need to be thought of and, and protected as much as we can. But it's kind of hard when they're very sensitive to these two changes in the ocean. They're very sensitive to the warming because they, they undergo bleaching, which is essentially the algae that live in their polyps because of their symbiotic relationship with these algae. Uh, they leave when the temperature rises too quickly and in a level that they don't like. And then essentially the coral has been bleached at that point and it's not necessarily dead, but it isn't necessarily living great and it will die. Um, so coral bleaching is really, really dangerous for coral reefs. And it's unlikely that the bleached corals can recover unless the algae comes back. And that's unlikely unless the water cools down. Ocean acidification is just as harmful to the corals because corals make their skeletons out of calcium carbonate. And with greater CO2 input to the oceans, uh, we get greater CO2 reacting with water, which makes carbonic acid, which pushes the calcium carbonate mineral toward the dissolution or dissolving side of its equilibrium reaction. In other words, it induces more ca calcium carbonate dissolution. It dissolves 
calcium carbonate minerals. And yeah, well, it's not acidifying the ocean quickly enough to actually actively dissolve all the corals like very quickly. It is causing the corals and mollusks and sponges and other organisms that build calcium carbonate skeletons to have a much harder time building these skeletons uh, to the point that it's just not favorable for them to do so anymore or to use up so much energy to produce those skeletons and therefore the ecosystems really suffer. In addition to this, the warming oceans are also weakening the equator to pole temperature gradient, both in the atmosphere and oceans, which is weakening the vertical mixing in the oceans because this temperature gradient uh, and winds, which are caused by the atmospheric temperature gradient, are what drive upwelling. In other words, the um, mixing of bottom waters up to the top waters in the ocean at coastlines. And this upwelling brings nutrients from the deeper, colder uh, water to the surface to cycle nutrients back to the primary producers. And it cycles uh, oxygen back down to the deep waters. And the problem with this weakened upwelling is upwelling actually also brings CO2 from the bottom of the ocean and back up to the surface and releases it to the atmosphere, which is one way that the ocean can kind of level off its carbon dioxide content. I mean, it's not great because we don't want it going to the atmosphere, but we also don't want it continuing to build up in the ocean. And the bad thing about it being building up in the ocean and the deep ocean is when we think about these surface corals bleaching, we think, well, okay, great, fine. Maybe the surface corals won't survive, but maybe the deep corals will adapt and survive this global warming period. But that seems bleak too because they're dealing with even more acidic conditions because more co2 can actually be dissolved and held in colder deeper waters so the surface corals are bleaching while the deep corals are dissolving essentially but miraculously there is actually a way that we can not only uh combat this decreasing ocean ph by you know inputting something into the ocean that might increase the pH um, and level that off, but also simultaneously lower atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. So this kind of kills two birds with one stone. It combats the atmospheric warming and combats ocean acidification all at once. So this idea is essentially just inducing chemical weathering of a specific mineral called olivine in coastal and rainy regions. The reason that olivine is really important and helpful in this aspect is because olivine is this magnesium silicate that when it reacts with CO2 and water, aka carbonic acid, it forms magnesium ions, bicarbonate ions, and silicic acid, which transport to the ocean and bicarbonate ions actually work to increase alkalinity or increase pH rather than decrease pH. And so that combats the ocean acidification problem while the weathering itself takes up CO2 from the atmosphere to actually occur. So while removing atmospheric CO2, this would also buffer, help to increase and buffer the ocean's pH. And this carbon that does get transported to the ocean as bicarbonate is more likely to eventually contribute to being completely buried and preserved as calcium carbonate in organic carbon deposits, which can become preserved in the rock record for millions of years and stored, or rather organic carbon burial and preservation, which still would store the carbon in the geosphere long-term, which is a good negative feedback for the current scenario. But another major change that's occurring in the oceans is ocean anoxia or oxygen decrease or depletion due to two things. The first one is, like I mentioned, the weakened ocean mixing that we talked about, the weakened upwelling. Uh, basically, that intensifies the stratification of the ocean, the like stagnation of the ocean layers, um, which is not great because that vertical mixing is what actually delivers oxygen to the deep oceans. And without that, the oxygen doesn't go down there and the deep oceans become anoxic. We've seen this in Earth's history when temperature gradients have become weaker from equator to poles, like during the Cretaceous or Jurassic during certain ocean anoxic events um, in the deep ocean especially. And so those can be really detrimental to marine life. But ocean oxygen concentrations, especially along coastlines, are also decreasing due to increases in primary productivity. Primary productivity blooms, like algal blooms, are 
flaring or increasing along certain coastlines where there's increased nutrient input because, well, one, there's increased CO2 in the atmosphere, so that's an increased nutrient, but there's also a lot more increased nutrient input from river runoff because of our over-fertilization of agricultural lands on, on land. And so that is leading to a lot of increased uh, influx of nitrogen, phosphorus, and other nutrients to the oceans, which is flaring these blooms. And beneath algal blooms, the oxygen is all used up to decompose that overabundance of organic carbon being produced by those algae. And that leads to oxygen depletion zones or uh, sometimes called ocean anoxic zones, but more commonly among media called dead zones or hypoxic zones. Those are really bad for fish and stuff. And so often when you see algae blooms, you'll see that not only do they lead to anoxia, but they also sometimes lead to toxic chemicals being produced. And that's really detrimental for marine life. And you'll see dead fish near algal blooms and stuff. And that's why marine animals, just like terrestrial ones, need oxygen to live. So anoxia essentially suffocates them. And the last major change when we think of what's changing in the ocean today, uh, most people think of sea level rise. And this is true. With the warming comes more ice melting, and this leads to a rise in sea level. There's also a rise in sea level due to thermal expansion as the water warms, which is another added layer of increased sea level. So it's not just the ice melting. But it's projected that nearly 500 million people might be displaced due to sea level rise by the year 2100. What's insane about this projection is that I read uh, a few different sources to try and find this number, and that's why I put plus or minus and the little squiggly to be like about, because what I found is that a source in 2016 said 13 million people. A source in 2020 said I think like 100 to 200 million. A source in 2021 said 400 million. And then a source from recent, I think 2022 or 23, said nearly 600 million. But I think they were talking about also um, agricultural you know, land loss and displacement from that. So I'm not sure um, if that one's accurate. But you can see the projection keeps increasing and that's because it continues to get worse. The reason is because of this thing called positive feedbacks. As more ice melts, the Earth's surface reflectivity decreases. It absorbs more solar radiation and gets warmer and warmer. And so the warming is essentially causing more rapid warming in itself. Um, and this is called a positive feedback loop. And this is really exacerbating or causing kind of an exponential trend of warming and sea level rise, which is not great. And those are really hard to stop once they get going. So that's one worry. Also, these projections continue to increase because, well, sometimes when we write papers in 2016, we have a little bit more faith in humanity uh, than maybe we should. And we haven't changed as many things as maybe we should. So I think that's another reason these projections continue to increase from paper to paper because we just didn't go the way we thought we would. So that's a little sad. In any case, the take home message is many people will be heavily affected by this uh, and not to mention the millions to billions of other organisms that will also be displaced, which I think we don't tend to think about, but that's also a really important factor. And I will have a video coming out relatively soon about the sixth mass extinction and what those organisms are currently that are being heavily affected by climate change and also about uh, more about the sea level rise as well as other factors uh, that have been occurring due to climate change and how essentially it's a video on how humans are impacting humans <laughs> and that that's going to be a fun one um I, te I tend to try and steer clear of these topics but i'm teaching this class that is essentially you know a very climate change focused class not because i chose to teach it it's quite depressing actually but i am and so i figure i might as well share this stuff online with you guys too yeah i know these videos are going to get more controversial as we go but it's stuff that's really important and needs to be talked about and it's about time that i just crawl out from under my rock and start talking about this stuff because it's real and it's happening and we got to do something. Um, and, you know, I always try and put a positive spin on it at the end. So I will again. And I always say this, but it's true. We are not the only species to have ever affected climate on Earth or induced climate change in it by any means. Um, I mean, the first photosynthesizers caused devastation on a global scale from you know, their production of oxygen, which at the time was toxic to most life. But we are potentially the first species, or pretty certainly the first species to 
recognize our impact and be able to do something about it. And I think that's really powerful and we should, we should use that. We shouldn't just let that go to waste. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed learning about how the ocean's currently changing. There are other minor and other major ways I probably just forgot to mention, but those are the ways that I'm currently discussing in the class that I'm teaching right now. And I think they're really important just to think about. Um, if there's any others that I missed that you guys wanna to bring to light in the comments, please do. Um, if there's any others that you want me to make a video about, please inform me in the comments below. I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts and your additions to um, what I've listed. And uh, yeah, I hope one of my students figures out a magic cure <laughs> to all of this, or you know, I hope everybody out there contributes to uh, continental weathering projects of olivine weathering projects because that'll be really really helpful but anyway yeah i hope you guys enjoyed references are linked down below as always and i will see you guys in my next video bye